environmental economist, activist, thinker, and philosopher. He has been an economics professor for many years in the US and India, and most recently a philosophy professor in Norway. I remember being uh, swarmed with the guilt of being a city person and uh, you know, uh, so much of Gandhiji. And then Asim gently pointed to an article by Tagore uh, around the city and the village and that really kind of was, was a big shift and I'm sure there are so many such nudges and shifts waiting to happen uh, with your sharing. So let's welcome Asim to share some of his ideas with us. I should say something about how I journeyed towards uh, Gandhiji and to Rabindranath or Gurudev, as I like to call him. Um, one's own treasure trove is the last to be mined, the words of a philosopher whose name escapes me now. Uh, but that's basically a tribute to my Macaulayite education, that when I was 17, I was handed the Communist Manifesto, and I was not given Hinswaraj. I discovered Hinswaraj on my own at the age of 34, long after I'd finished my PhD dissertation and been recognized as an economist, is when I discovered that Gandhiji actually wrote Hinswaraj. That's how poorly educated I was and I remain, uh, thanks to uh, a structure of education which is uh, consistently oppressive and consistently directed towards goals which feed all the pathologies that you've been hearing about uh, this morning. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, it was well into my 30s that I started reading Rabindranath and Gandhi seriously. Before then, I mean, uh, for, for many of us, I think, in this room, since the time that we sort of uh, attained consciousness, uh, Gandhiji and uh, Gurudev were part of our imagination, but exactly what they stood for, what they fought for, what sort of lives they lived, what they felt, what they thought, uh, none of those things were really discussed in any serious intellectual way uh, by the standards by which Western thinkers, for instance, are discussed across all our Anglophone, uh, so-called liberal institutions, I teach at one of them in Sonipat uh, right now at Ashoka University. And uh, I do not believe that uh, Gandhi and Rabindranath are given their due as thinkers and as uh, pioneers. And I name just two out of possibly 200 or 2,000 uh, that we might have had. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think that it's time that we started looking at our own treasures for a change and break the chain of uh, a pedagogical uh, uh, tyranny uh, that we have been subject to all our lives, those of us who studied in English language institutions. Uh, I want to move to another spot now, and I want to make Gandhi and Rabindranath relevant for us by actually fast forwarding to 2047. Why do I pick 2047? Because India will be modern India, independent, sovereign, so-called sovereign India, would be 100 years old uh, that time. It will also be 28 years from today. And if you remember 28 years back is when we attained economic freedom as per our economist gurus, right? Uh, so 1991 is when India liberalized its economy. And since then, uh, I'd like to put before you the idea that we've been living with the wrong definition of freedom all along, not just since 1991, but from long before that. And Gandhi and Rabindranath are two people who had the spine and the courage to say it loud and clear to the modern world, especially to the modern Western world, look, you are not free and we'll tell you why. So uh, let's go forward to 2047. Uh, Devinderji said, and I think he's right, that virtually every uh, government in India since at least Rajiv Gandhi's time, if not earlier, has wanted 70 to 80% of India living in cities, right? That's the index of development, right? You want to put an end to uh, rural living and so on, that's seen as backward. 
uh, and simply follow in the steps of the master who ruled you for centuries, right? Uh, so let's assume that this vision comes to fruition. That is to say, India does become developed and urbanized, or shall we use the right word, metropolitanized. Hmm? We become nice and sexy like the rest of the global world, right? We join the global world, we have our seat at the high tables and so on, by 2047, right? Three quarters of India at that time means about 12 to 1300 million people, right? Let's just do a thought experiment of what would have to become true for 12 to 1300 million Indians to be living in cities, either pre-existing cities or cities which grew around the towns and villages where they're presently living, or brand new cities uh, a la China, right? And I'm gonna to try to show to you that the success of this model of development will be its worst nemesis. That is to say, if development succeeds, it would have failed completely because there shall be no India uh, at the end of the story. Uh, that's giving you the punchline in advance, but let's just work through the steps to the conclusion very quickly. Number one, you will be causing uh, and this is somehow unremarked uh, in most discussions with noble exceptions, one of them sitting, two of them sitting right in front of me, you will be causing an epistemic break in the transmission of manual skills as far as agriculture is concerned for the very first time in India's ancient medieval modern history. Whatever our farmers have been doing for five or 10,000 years, in the communication and transmission of those skills from one generation to the next, you'll be causing an epistemic and cognitive break. Why? Because as those of us who travel around rural India know very well, nobody wants to do agriculture anymore, okay? Why don't people want to give, do agriculture? For the reasons that Devinderji laid out so clearly. The feminization of the workforce in agriculture. I find that a strange expression because I think women were always seriously involved in agriculture from the very beginning. They were not confined to homes like, you know, uh, modern uh, uh, industrial societies have been. Uh, but this feminization of the workforce has taken place increasingly in the last 20, 30 years, where a disproportionately large number of women compared to men are now working in agriculture. Uh, there's a, a dramatic decline in the participation rate of women uh, across India from something like 30, 32% to about 20, 22% uh, in the last decade, uh, virtually. Uh, so if you look at data on uh, uh, how many women are willing to come forward to register themselves as even unemployed, uh, that number has gone down because of what economists call discouraged workers. Uh, so you are quite convinced that in order to achieve this development, it's worth causing this epistemic break in the transmission of skills for doing manual agriculture. You succeed in doing that, right? Number one, uh, if you're not gonna do manual agriculture, obviously you will do mechanized agriculture, corporate farming and so on, which means you've thought about the energy requirements for that at a very conservative, even 50%, even if you assume just 50% of your energy is coming from fossil fuels by that time, which is, as I said, a conservative number, it might be 60% or something, uh, where are you gonna get these fuels exactly? And you're talking about oil, coal, natural gas. India's already importing a lot of coal because Indian coal has a high fly ash content and so on. Uh, we, of course, import huge amounts of oil, and we are in the era of peak oil, well past peak oil, actually, so oil is running out. The world is going to be running out of fossil fuels, thank God. Uh, so uh, where are you planning to obtain the energy? Um, no clear answers uh, to this, as far as I know. Uh, on the other side of the industrial agriculture equation, carbon emissions. 
will be growing in a time of shrinking climate space, very rapidly shrinking climate space. Already we know what the facts are, right? And you can go on and on. You can think about the assumptions you're making about the supply of water for agriculture, the salinization of our coastline. I mean, India might lose an area the size of Pakistan by 2030 if the salinization of the coastline proceeds at current rates because of massive amounts of dam building. Uh, think about soil deterioration, billions of tons of topsoil lost every year, and so on. So agriculture is basically not a viable proposition. You're talking about a population of 1.7 billion people. Now, the optimist among the economists will say, well, we'll import the food because India will be a large $50 trillion economy by then, and so on, and we'll have the money to import the food. Well, I don't know whether you know, but in the last 75 years, there have been just two years when India has had a surplus on its balance of payments. That is to say, on its external account, when India's earnings from its exports are greater than its imports, there have been just two years like that. So most of the time when we are buying uh, goods from abroad, including oil, of course, and machines and computers and mobiles and everything, uh, we are paying for it through borrowings, okay? So our debt is substantial, international debt is substantial. We justify it by saying that our foreign exchange reserves are also very high, but that is usually just parked money which can leave in the moment of capital flight if there is a panic in global markets, and then you'll be back to 1991, only much, 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 much worse, okay? We haven't been tested on that yet, thankfully. Uh, so, uh, the possibility of importing food uh, is not very high either, especially in a time of global scarcity. So, no country is going to be interested in selling you that much food. There's no substitute, as Vandana Shiva, I think, says somewhere, for the Indo-Gangetic Plain on this earth, okay? Uh, uh, an area, a river valley, which has supported such a huge civilization for so long, uh, there is no substitute, just like there's no substitute for the Himalayas and so on. So uh, you need to think through all of this, okay? If you are saying that you want this development, you want this growth, and including the Amartya Sen version of high human development index and so on, all that is pointing in the direction of not just unsustainability, but an ecological dismembering of the subcontinent as we know it, as any of our ancestors have known it. Let's, this is not just on rural India, right? Now think about urban India. Think about metropolitan India. You have 1,200 million people living there now, or living here now, okay? 800 million more than currently. Think about clean air. Think about clean water. Think about quantity of water. Think about what happens when water supply shrinks and the quality of water deteriorates and there are waterborne diseases which resume on an epidemic scale in the cities. Think about public health. Think about power and energy. Think about security, especially for women, etc. There's like a huge, huge slew of such problems which you immediately confront, and it is what mathematicians call reductio ad absurdum. So, in other words, development is a terrible failure if it succeeds. Okay? In other words, it's not possible. Simply what we are trying to do or what they are trying to do on our backs is simply not possible. It's just impossible. Ecologically, we will be thrown off uh, this land, or rather we'll be absorbed by uh, Bhumata. Right? Uh, this is the reality. Uh, we don't discuss it because of the reasons which should be quite obvious. Um, so, and this now brings me to Gandhiji and to Gurudev. Uh, they were thinking about this since the 1890s or so. Uh, remarkably, uh, Rabindranath wrote A Robbery of the Soil and Muktadhara, two very important tracts. Uh, well, Robbery of the Soil is an essay. And uh, again, nobody ever told me to read this essay. It's a brilliant essay on town and country, the one which Abhishek was referring to before. And Muktadhara, which is, uh, I, I won't go into it here, but it's a fantastic story about uh, dam building 
and which presages development over the next 100 years before the first big dam was built in India in, in Mulshi in Maharashtra, the dam which supplies power to Bombay and Pune to this day. Uh, before that dam was built, Rabindranath wrote in 1922 a play called uh, Muktadhara, which is uh, basically forecasting what development is going to do. So these people were thinking about uh, the future in a very, very serious way. And the reason they were able to think about the future in a very effective, serious way was because they were looking at the present with very few tinted glasses on. Okay? They were looking at it very squarely, the facts in the face, and trying to divine from that what the future is going to look like. Now, intellectuals, I'm afraid, make too much of, of the differences between Gandhi and Rabindranath. And there are differences, there are very serious differences, but I don't think this is the occasion or the forum to go into those differences. Here, I want to emphasize five things which are common to both of them and which we would be well advised uh, to take uh, seriously as pointers or guideposts to the future as well as the present and the past. Number one, uh, it seems to me that both of them were very clear that at the root of the crisis of global modernity, as some people might like to call it to think of today, at the root of that crisis is a spiritual crisis, okay? which is to say the loss of faith. Now, you may come from different denominations, we all typically do come from different denominations, different belief systems, different faiths, and the plurality of that is what is so wonderful. But the fact that uh, that faith is not recognized as something of value in and of itself uh, had become very clear to them uh, back then. In the secularization of the modern world, the sacred was also lost. And that lies at the root of it. And Gandhi talks about this in Hind Swaraj when he says, we are turning away from God. And he is referring to India. Uh, Hind Swaraj is addressed to Indian readers, but it's of course meant for global readers too. Okay, uh, now this is a huge topic in itself. We can go into it in discussion time in the afternoon. The second point, both of them are very clear that this is a civilizational crisis of modernity. This is not just the crisis of capitalism as a lot of Marxists and leftists have tried to understand. This is a civilizational crisis. It goes much deeper. In other words, it has material dimensions which may express themselves as uh, the pathologies of capitalism, but it has spiritual and cultural dimensions, uh, which are extremely important, which lead to the breakdown of communities, which we've been hearing about all morning, as well as to psychological despair because of social isolation, because an intrinsic aspect of humanity, which is to say uh, human beings as social animals has been virtually forgotten by modernity in the rush for individual freedom what has basically happened, and here I'm using my words, these are not their thoughts, the individual has been split into two. The public life as a citizen has been handed over to the state, and the private life as a, a, a private individual has been auctioned to corporations. So now we all live in a global Zuckerberg year, one might call it, in which we pretend that we are free. And we are taught to say that we are free, just like those characters in Monty Python. Uh, we repeat, we rehearse those things, and we are afraid to say we are not free. And we are afraid to look into the causes of uh, the unfreedom. So this is the second point. And uh, Gandhi in Hinswaraj and Rabindranath in multiple places, including his last testament, which is Shobhitar Shankot, uh, uh, Crisis in Civilization, which is a recorded radio broadcast in 1941 in the middle of the war. Uh, they both agree that this is almost a terminal crisis of Western civilization. As far as I can see, Western civilization in any classical sense is long over. Now you're living in global modernity, which is a very different animal from Western civilization. Number three, uh, the ecological crisis of modernity was forecast and foreseen very clearly. And the reasons for it, I'll use my words to paraphrase Rabindranath here, there's a structural ecological alienation. 
and which has a hundred things behind it, which again we can discuss. And that structural ecological alienation is so deep that there's not a person sitting in this room, for instance, who is not structurally ecologically alienated. And so therefore we don't notice when we are doing damage because the route through which the damage is being done is now, has now been rendered so abstract and so remote from our imaginations that we don't feel like we are culpable in any way. Uh, but individually and especially institutionally because of the vast amounts of social consumption taken through large organizations and corporations and so on, uh, definitely there is a big problem. And again, Rabindranath notes it in hundred different places that you can go to. And again, no school child in this country is taught Rabindranath in that way. Number four, for both of them, the community comes first, not the state. So the social is more important than the political, so to speak. Again, I won't go into this in great depth, but Rabindranath's essay, or rather lecture to congressmen in 1904, Our Swadeshi Samaj, is worth looking at in this context. Uh, number five, for both of them, the village was very dear. Rabindranath calls villages the cradle of civilization. Uh, and he holds uh, the, the female half of the human race responsible uh, for uh, the upkeep of the cradle, so to speak. Uh, that can be interpreted in multiple ways, and again, we can talk about it later. Uh, so uh, the importance given to the village is shared by both. The difference is that Gandhi is completely dismissive of cities, and Rabindranath uh, wants to have a dialogue between town and country. And that's where robbery of the soil is a very important tract because that's a place where Rabindranath shows you that this is a marriage where divorce is not an option. Okay, uh, The marriage of town and country, they both need each other in different ways. And there's a lot more to say about this, of course. Uh, I just want to say one more thing about the, uh, the structural ecological alienation. It gets built into our basic childhood cognition. And we are reared on that. And Rabindranath is extremely sensitive to this. Uh, if you read Chinnapatro, which are letters that he writes to his niece, Indira Devi, from his uh, family estate in Shalaidaha in East Bengal, uh, beautiful letters. Uh, they're very, very poetic. Some of the best writing on nature that uh, you would read. And uh, it becomes very clear uh, when you read those that this man was wise and courageous to say goodbye to Macaulay at the age of 13 when he decided to quit school and never returned. I wish I had that kind of courage even at 23 or 33. But that is what stands out and I think is the single most courageous act of Rabindranath's life that he could leave school forever and ever, coming from the most educated family of Bengal and where competition for all sorts of civil services and bar exam, this and that was so severe. Uh, coming from that sort of background to simply say in the language of uh, Bihari, because I grew up in Bihar, Tinga Lele, Kushni Milega, I'm not coming your way. I'm not an idiot, not yet at least. So, uh, so these are the main things that one can sort of draw from. And to conclude, there's a lot more I had in mind, but time has run out. Uh, but what I take from all this is the outlines of what I think of as Prakritik Swaraj. Prakritik referring to nature, but nature not just outside of us, nature within us, outer ecology, inner ecology, there has to be a dialogue. No question of domination one way or the other, but the resumption of a long-torn, long-worn relationship. Uh, a res the resumption of a dialogue between humanity and the rest of the natural world. Even here, we are in the natural world, but because we are in such a highly processed man-made environment, we forget that we have to breathe, we have to do all sorts of things in order to stay alive even in this room. To conclude, um, in so far as the broader philosophical question is concerned, which is the meaning of life itself, why are we here? Why are we born? What do we do? what happens when we die, that sort of thing. Uh, Rabindranath has an answer to that. And that's what I find most remarkable about uh, essays like Shadana, 
which he writes for Americans in the summer of 1915, uh, where he talks openly about the infinite. And he says that the realization of the infinite is why we are here. And once one realizes it, and one loses the sort of illusions of one's egoic self, is when one finds mukti. And this is what our ancient rishis were uh, practicing, not just dreaming of, but actually practicing 3,000 years ago. And so he quotes from the Upanishads and so on. Now, uh, how does modern society seek the infinite? Well, the advertisers and the marketing people mobilize our desires. And then desires are the vehicle through which you chase the infinite. And if you look at the sub, sub, sub text of virtually every ad, and sometimes you don't have to look very deep, it's, they're always selling you the infinite, either through fear or through greed. One of the two mechanisms is constantly operating in every ad. Uh, so, in other words, uh, you're constantly going to be looking for it, whether you like it or not, because that's our nature. Our nature is to seek the infinite in some form or another. If you can't find this very interesting, you, you will be doing this, right? And that's what marketing is all about. I think I have touched the limits of my time, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for listening.